Hi, this is Keith Kaiser with another word of wisdom from the Gospel according to Mark. Today we're continuing in Mark chapter 11, verse 12. Mark 11, verse 12. Our Lord has come up to Jerusalem for the last time before the crucifixion. He and the disciples, after initially going into the city and looking around at the temple, uh, then he goes out and spends the night with the twelve in Bethany. And then we read in verse 12, Now the next day, when they had come out from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing from afar a fig tree having leaves, he went to see if perhaps he would find something on it. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. In response, Jesus said to it, Let no one eat fruit from you forever again. And his disciples heard it. And we'll find out later in verse 20. Now in the morning as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered away. Now this is a unique miracle that the Lord did here because the Lord did not do miracles that were destructive. He did miracles that were constructive. You think about the other miracles that he did. He cleansed lepers, that is, he restored their flesh to wholeness. He uh, healed people that were physically handicapped, that is, he restored their bodies to wholeness. A man with a withered hand in Mark chapter 3, he restored that hand to be whole as the other. He raised the dead. He restored people to what they were in life, in other words. And so the Lord was very constructive. We might say these were positive miracles. And yet here is a miracle that's destructive, uh, that's most definitely negative, in that he kills this fig tree. Now, this is certainly not an exhibition of temper on the Lord's part. Uh, you know, the Lord would on times demonstrate righteous anger, and we're about to see a story when he goes into the temple of that. But the Lord did not just fly off the handle. The Lord didn't lose it like so many of us struggle with our tempers, and sometimes we lose it in traffic or at the grocery store when things aren't just how we want it or whatever. The Lord was perfectly under control. He was the perfect man. He never sinned. He was full of grace and truth. So there's something else going on here. Like many of the miracles, these are what John calls them signs. In other words, a sign points to something. If you come to my town, we have a sign that says Birdsboro. So you know, oh, I'm in Birdsboro, Pennsylvania. I see the sign that's indicating the place. Or if you're up the highway a bit, the sign points down the hill to our town, says Birdsboro, one mile. So you'd say, oh, Birdsboro must be down there because look, the sign is pointing to it. And in similar fashion, these miracles pointed to certain truths that the Lord Jesus wanted to express. Now, just a moment that as the Lord came the next day, we're reminded of his real humanity because he was hungry, that our Lord was subject to all the natural impulses and desires, sin apart, okay? The only thing different in his humanity from our humanity is his was untainted by sin. He was incorruptible and impeccable, incapable of sinning. That's the only difference. In every other respect, our Lord got physically tired, our Lord got thirsty, our Lord got hungry, our Lord uh, not only hungered for food, he hungered for fellowship, he desired for certain things to be accomplished, he said, with desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you, and so forth. So our Lord had every natural appetite completely untainted by sin. He lived the experience of a perfect human being. And as a perfect human being, rather than that make him somehow unreal in our world, it actually makes him, uh, as the book of Hebrews points out in chapters 2 and 4 especially, it makes him a high priest who's able to deal with our infirmities, who knows about the trials and troubles we go through because he's been tested in every point yet without sin, or as Darby translates it, sin apart. So, the Lord knows all about our struggles, as the hymn writer said. He knows all the troubles we go through. Another old spiritual says, nobody knows the troubles I've seen. Nobody knows but Jesus, and that's true. But the Lord also knows something we don't know. He doesn't know the experience of failure. He doesn't know the experience of yielding to temptation. He knows 
overcoming temptation. He knows triumphing over it and being obedient to his Father in all things. So he's uniquely suited to have compassion on us and yet also to succor us, to give us the help we need, to strengthen us and enable us to stand in this world and overcome sin by our faith in he who is the Son of God, our blessed Lord Jesus Christ himself. Nonetheless, he was hungry. And it can help but think in this context, yes, it's physical hunger, but thinking about what's about to happen, that he's coming up to Jerusalem for the last time, and so few received him, so few knew who he was and bowed the knee and acknowledged Jesus as their Lord and Messiah, as the Christ. In view of that, we can think about his hunger for people to know him. We can also think about his hunger that he expressed in his prayer to his father in John 17. Father, I have done the work which thou gavest me to do. Glorify thou me with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. So the Lord wanted to return to that glory. He wanted to go back to that place of being who he could be naturally. The son of God in glory, uh, acclaimed by the seraphim and cherubim and the 24 elders and the living creatures and all the denizens of heaven worshiping him and carrying out his will. And not here in a world of sin and degradation and moral filth, but above that. And now he was never tainted by it. He walked through this evil world and himself did not become impure, the perfect, pure, peerless son of God. But wonderful that he's ascended now and on high and is in glory, that he's entered into heaven and is at the right hand of God, angels and principalities and powers being made subject to him, as 1 Peter 3.22 says. But as the Lord here was physically hungry as well, verse 13 says, seeing from afar a fig tree having leaves. Now he went to see if perhaps he would find something on it. And at first this seems a bit unfair because it says when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves because it was not the season for figs. And we might say, that poor fig tree, it wasn't the season for figs. Why was the Lord angry that he came to the tree and the tree did not have figs? Why did the Lord curse the tree in this fashion, saying, let no one eat fruit from you forever again? And it's really that sometimes the botanists tell us that in the ancient world, and I don't know much about fig trees, but there is such a thing as winter figs that... Uh, they can have a sort of proto-fruit, not the full-blown figs that one can eat later in the time of harvest, whenever one harvests figs. But at the time Jesus was coming up to Jerusalem, they could have an edible kind of fruit to eat. And ha seeing a tree with leaves on it, there might be something on there that the Lord could come and eat. And yet, although the tree, if you will, was professing to have fruit, it really had none. And when we think about the context in which this is set and how the Lord's going to explain it in a moment, it, it's a very powerful enacted parable. It's, it's a way, in other words, of describing a spiritual situation. He was coming up to Jerusalem, which purported to be the city of the great king. Jerusalem, where the crowds acclaimed him as he was coming in, and we've already seen they cried out, Hosanna! Save now, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So this city claims to want the Lord. They claim to want Jesus the Messiah. They claim to want to see him come in and bring in the kingdom of God. And yet, in reality, they're being hypocritical. They're near to God with their mouth, but their hearts are far from him. And the fact that the throng is going to cry out for him to be crucified in just a few days, and he's going to be taken outside of that city and subjected to the worst form of death, the most calculatedly humiliating death, the one filled with more torture than any other that they knew of, that he was going to be subjected to that showed the real state of the nation. As, first, as John 1 says, that he came unto his own things, and his own people received him not. Now, we're not any better than those ancient Jerusalemites or the ancient nation of Israel because uh, many of us have grown up surrounded by the gospel, surrounded by the word, surrounded by believers. And we, we could say with new old years I spent in vanity and pride, 
caring not my Lord was crucified, knowing not it was for me he died at Calvary. I'm thankful that I got saved as a child of seven, and yet I look back and think, why did it take you so long, Keith? You knew for all of those years previous, as soon as you can remember anything, you remember your mom and your dad telling you about the Lord Jesus, telling you that he came to die for you, a sinner, and that you needed to be saved. And so uh, we don't have any room to point the finger at anybody. The Lord Jesus died on the cross. As a modern hymn says, it was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. And an older hymn says, was it for crimes that I had done? He groaned upon the tree. Amazing pity, grace unknown, and love beyond degree. And indeed, that's true. He died for our sins, according to the scriptures, 1 Corinthians 15 says. Now, the disciples heard him curse this tree. Let no one eat fruit from you forever again. And the tree really is like Israel. And fig trees uh, throughout the Bible are sometimes used as typifying Israel. So this wasn't an unusual thing for the Lord to select. And the tree was really like Israel, like Jerusalem, in fact, at that point. And we see it in the next story in verse 15. So they came to Jerusalem. Then Jesus went into the temple and began to drive out those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he would not allow anyone to carry wares through the temple. Then he taught them, saying to them, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations? But you have made it a den of thieves. And the scribes and chief priests heard it and saw how they might destroy him, for they feared him, because all the people were astonished at his teaching. When evening had come, he went out of the city. So the Lord goes into the temple. Now this is supposed to be the house of God. This is supposed to be the place where they would have the greatest acquaintance of God. They have all of the different pieces of furniture in that temple are geared around the worship of God, are meant to teach them about the holiness and the uniqueness of the true and living God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And yet when the Lord goes in there, they're too busy making it a mercantile endeavor. They're buying and selling. It's like Walmart, not like the temple. They're selling stuff. They're doing business and maybe doing it uh, somehow cheating people even because he calls it a den of thieves there in the uh, citation that he makes from the Old Testament. But uh, that be the case. The very fact that they had brought commerce into the temple and that it was now a money-making endeavor was odious to him. It was offensive to God. It was something he repudiated. They were keeping people from doing what the temple was meant to be used for, that is, to make it a house of prayer. And notice he says, for all nations, not just for Israel, but the point was that this temple was meant to stand as a beacon to the nations. Israel itself was meant to be a light to the nations and draw people to know the true and living God who was in their midst. And yet they weren't doing that. They had taken his temple and perverted it to something else. I can't help but think that the modern church in many cases is guilty of the same thing. That even though uh, we have, uh, we can talk about people preaching false gospels on the air, people that don't talk about sin, people that confuse physical prosperity and wealth with spiritual salvation, and those are in their own category of error and their own category of falsehood. And yet, even among true believers that preach the real gospel, oftentimes the impression left with people that don't know the Lord when they hear their broadcast or view it on television or maybe go to their church is that these people are all about money, that they want to get money from people. And that's one of the very reasons why the local church I fellowship with does not take open public um, collections, that we don't want to give the wrong impression, and we don't solicit from people money. We don't ask people for money. We don't make pleas. And we especially don't receive money from people we know make no profession of Christianity or don't seem to be real believers. And that's totally against the Word of God. The missionaries that John speaks about in the epistles, and I think it's Second John, he says they went forth taking nothing of the Gentiles. And the example of the Bible is, uh, both Old and New Testament, by the way, is that the Lord's work is to be supported by the Lord's people, not by the world. And yet we can even give the wrong impression 
when we make things so much about the physical, so much about how fancy our building is or how much money we need to do this or that ministry or carrying on this work. And we may be trying to do a good work for the Lord and maybe we are doing a work that's being used by the Lord, but we're also sending mixed signals about what our motivation is. Are we in it for the money? Or is this just another kind of business? And many times business principles are baptized. They're brought into the church and plugged in uh, in the name of church growth. And really, church growth biblically is growing in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus, as Peter says in Second Peter 3. Or growing in our likeness to Christ, growing in obedience to his will, growing in pleasing him. That's the real growth. And if we're doing that, uh, we're going to see the Lord work through us and we can have the joy of seeing people come to faith in the Christ whom we love and serve. Now, he went there to the temple and rather than being justly rebuked and admonished and saying, you're right, we need to repent, we need to change this, the Lord goes up into the temple and John 2 tells us he had to do the same thing at the beginning of his ministry. Now, about three and a half years later, he's doing it again at the end of his ministry. And the scribes and the chief priests heard it and sought how they might destroy him. So rather than this producing repentance, it actually incited greater enmity in the Lord's enemies, that those who were not saved, even though they should have known Messiah, they were the experts on the temple and the Bible. Nonetheless, they sought how they might destroy him, for they feared him because all the people were astonished at his teaching. Now, the Lord said he would build his church in Matthew 16. And we have to be careful that we're not building our church, that it's not our work that we're doing the way we want to do it for our glory. And then we just ask the Lord to kind of come in and rubber stamp it. And that's basically what these people wanted to do. They wanted to keep running the temple their way, benefiting from the temple system their way, and have Messiah just show up and get rid of the Romans and exalt them in glory. They would have been quite happy with that sort of arrangement. But the Lord won't grant that. The Lord won't allow that. It is his church that he's building. And we have to bow to his way of doing it and say, my Lord and my God, use me as a living stone in that church. Help me to use the gifts you've given to work for it. And these people, though they were very religious, showed that they were not saved because they didn't have any love for the Son. And if you didn't love the Son of God or you don't love the Son of God, you can't say you love the Father either. Because those who love the Father love the Son also. Jesus himself said that. So they wanted to hurt him, but for they feared him, because all the people were astonished at his teaching. When we compare what's said in the parallel passage in Matthew 21, they fear the people also, and so they don't want to touch the Lord. They don't want to lose favor with the people. They were, uh, as Proverbs says, the fear of man brings a snare, and they were ensnared with that public opinion. They'd take a poll before they'd take a step. So the Lord leaves them without harm at that moment, but they're already plotting and have been plotting for some time how to kill him, how to destroy him. And so again, we see verse 19, when evening had come, he went out of the city. He's not comfortable in Jerusalem. Now that dead fig tree, therefore, was a good enacted parable, a good example of the spiritual reality in Jerusalem, in the temple, and in Israel as a whole, for the most part, that they didn't recognize the Lord when he was in their midst. Even though they said they were his people, said they were waiting for Messiah, the fruit was decidedly lacking. And if people have profession, but no possession, if they say they're believers, but there's no reality to it, faith without works is dead, James 2 says. If we don't have the evidence to back up our words that we're a believer, then we're not real. And guess what? Just as the judgment of the Lord came against the fig tree, it'll come against us as well. So my dear friend today, if you're just professing, come to the Lord Jesus and receive him, that you may possess him, that you may believe on him unto salvation and say, Lord, change my life and be my Lord and my God. Save me a sinner and the Lord will do it. Thank you for listening.